I have to begin by saying I, I agree with you about the Steve Jobs being amazing, and I also admire him in this incredible way. That I, uh, several years of my life went by where I never, I never had a day where I didn't think about him a lot. Um, but he was also, you know, exceedingly weird, you know, like a really strange guy, which is what I think gave fuel to the blog and and uh, um, and to the humor behind it. That said, I, I, I was talking to these guys, and apparently a few years ago at this summit, Joe Klein from uh, Time Magazine, our big competitor, apparently said some stuff about Republicans and got like attacked, right? Um, so, and Apple people, I don't know if you also know this, Apple people are way weirder and more savage than Republicans. So um, please, if, if anything I say does you know, offend you, just, just, just write a nasty tweet about it later, and, and, uh, uh, but, but please don't attack me physically. Um, Seriously, you have no, no idea as a journalist when you're covering Apple, like the wrath of the Apple faithful is like nothing else on earth. Um, and I've stumbled into it a, a number of times and always, uh, it's always painful. So I have some slides. I'll start with, um, oh, so this is also, this is the speech I was going to give. So forgive me about this. I had to call an audible because I, I had this speech about the eight simple secrets of Apple's success and it's kind of serious as these bullet points. And these guys told me like, no, you guys have been sitting through this conference for two days, you really just wanted, you know, something more fun, you've been out drinking in the patio and you're dying to get back out there and drink some more, so keep it short and keep it funny. So um, instead I'm going to do this, Insanely Great or Just Insane, the lunatic culture of the world's most successful company. And the thing of it is, is that they really are phenomenally successful, and I'll talk a little bit about that, and they really are also phenomenally weird, you know, they're incredibly secretive, <clears throat> they're, and they're incredibly arrogant in a lot of ways, they're almost like a cult in some ways. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my, my blog and how it came uh, about. So I was working at Forbes and I was very bored. I had nothing to do and I really wanted to work in online media and they wouldn't let me work in the online division at Forbes. So I thought I'll start my own blog. But I didn't want to start a blog you know, in my, in my own voice because nobody cares what I have to think. So I thought I'll do a CEO spoof blog and I tried a bunch of different ones and I finally I, I did the Steve Jobs one and it started getting traction. And pretty soon it went crazy. I had like a million uniques a month. From that, it grew into a book deal. I got outed. I was doing it anonymously. I got outed. I got caught by the New York Times. And I thought, oh, this is going to destroy my career. And instead, you know, I got a book deal. The book deal turned into a cable TV show that I worked on for a couple of years. And then it never aired because kind of Steve got sick and it just was, then the network was having problems. It was a startup network. Um, but anyway, I got this Newsweek job out of it. So it turns out that, like this stupid suicidal thing that I did that the whole time I was doing it, I thought like, oh shit, I'm never going to work again. It turned out to be like the best thing I ever did in my life. Um, it also gave me this front row seat on what was turning out to be the most amazing story, I think, in business history. You know? And I had never covered Apple as a journalist. I always covered enterprise stuff like IBM, and I always thought Apple was just this kind of silly, wacky company. But as you can see in this chart, this is the... Um, the revenues over the last 10 years. And if you look from 05, 06, I think it was about 14 billion in 2005 or 06, up to 108 billion this year. And the key number to look at is the blue part. That's iOS revenues, right? 70% of annual revenues last year, fiscal uh, 2011 ended in September, were, were iOS, iPad and iPhone. So think about it, that's a business that didn't exist in 2007, right? That came out, you know, that has been built from the ground up in five years, right? A more interesting thing is this last quarter, the December holiday quarter. It was the, I don't know if you know this, but it was like the third biggest quarter that any company has ever had in history. The only two bigger ones were oil companies, right? $46 billion they did uh, in December compared to 28 last year. So this is a company that's more than $100 billion in revenue growing at 73% last quarter. I mean, that's just not supposed to happen, right? And again, 33.6 billion of that is iOS. It's iPhone and iPad, right? That's a $30 billion a quarter business, run rate, say, 100, 120, um, that didn't exist five years ago. That $30 billion is bigger than all of Microsoft. In fact, the iPhone itself now is bigger than all of Microsoft. The, just their growth last year was like one and a half Googles. So the scale of Apple is just, you know, mind-blowing. Um, to look at the stock, this starts to tell you the story of the... the, the the comeback. I don't know if, any, if some, I'll quickly tell you the whole story of Apple for any of you who don't know it. It started in a garage in 1976. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, two friends, 
set out to make a simple computer that anyone could use. And they were literally in the garage of Jobs' parents' house. And in the early 80s, they came up with the Apple II, they started to take off, they went public. In 1984, they made the Mac, which was the first computer with a graphical user interface and a mouse. In 1985, Jobs gets thrown out of his own company. He goes off for 11 years, he, he starts a company called Next, which is a workstation company, he buys Pixar and builds that. And in 96, Apple is almost dead. After 11 years without him, they have screwed it up so bad that they bring him back. They buy Next, bring him back in, all right? And it was so dire, if you see the yellow uh, arrow, that's where they were in 97. I think they were down to three bucks a share, and they had hardly any money left in the bank. They were literally asking California for tax breaks that would give them $15 million in a tax break. Like, that's how, much, how badly off they were. Um, and Michael Dell famously said, someone asked him when Jobs came back, well, if you were Steve Jobs, what would you do? And he said, I'd shut it down and give the money back to the shareholders. So, right, thanks, right? You remember, it's hard to believe now, but in 97, Dell was like, you know, they were killing it, right? They were doing really well, right? Um, I know you're laughing, but they were, right? So Steve Jobs, a few days later, and this is why Jobs became like such a great character for me as a fiction writer. Um, Jobs is at an all-hands meeting a few days later at Apple, you know, first, with, first meeting with all the, all the crew, and you know, morale is the worst it's ever been. They feel like crap. And Michael Dell has just said this. And some brave soul puts up his hand and says, you know, what do you think about what Michael Dell says? And Steve said very eloquently, fuck Michael Dell. <laughs> and so, right, which is like classic, right? But, and by the way, the guys that backstage told me this is the first use of the word fuck in the whole conference. So I'm, I'm very glad of that. And I have a couple other things that I'm pretty sure will be the, the first use of that. Oh, they, they want the dirty stuff. So, um, but what I love about this is it's like, and then he went on to say, look, we're going to turn this around. Believe it or not, we're going to do it. If you don't want to do this, if you think we can't, you know, fuck you, walk out, see you, see you later. We don't need you. Leave, right? And that's, that, this is part of why people loved him, you know? But he was also, you know, he, he was very charismatic, but he was incredibly obnoxious, right? He was really, really nasty to people and belittling and dehumanizing. He could be really, really rough to work for. Um, and I think he really in life didn't really want to run a company as much as he wanted to be a cult leader. And if you look at this, you know, in other stories, in the early 80s, he wanted everyone at Apple to wear a uniform. He went to Japan and saw all the workers at, at Panasonic wore one uniform and Sony had another. And, and they said, yeah, that's what we do. And so he had Issey Miyake make up these different prototype uniforms for Apple employees and actually brought them back and showed them off. And they were like, dude, we're in California. We're not going to wear a fucking uniform. Team <laughs> so, but then, but he was so crazy. He said, well, I am. You know, like, I'm going to wear a uniform. So he had Issey Miyake make him a hundred of these things. And he wore them every day, right? And this is a picture, like, this is what Steve saw when he looked in the mirror every day. And, and, and what his employees see even now when they think of him. And, and believe me, I know he, 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 did, he died. And, you know, it, it may be too early. But I, I love the guy, right? I admire the guy. But I think it's fun to have fun with his image. Um, I have a few puzzles for you. and see if you can figure this out. If the Church of Scientology went into consumer electronics, it would be Apple, right? <laughs> And this one is, if Tony Soprano ran Disneyland, you'd have Apple. And the other one that I don't have a slide for is this, though. If the Dalai Lama and Charles Manson had a baby, it would be Steve Jobs. Like, it's sort of the mix of those two, right? This is sort of the stuff I had on my blog. Um, Apple Public Relations, right? This is how they treat us. And I, I ran this with the thing. The, the, the woman who runs Public Relations at Apple's name, Katie, Katie Cotton. And I ran this saying, you know, here's Katie out there waiting. Something had happened in the news. Katie's waiting for the guy from the Wall Street Journal to show up today. And... Um, and this is an Apple press event. That's Walt Wasberg, <laughs> David Pogue. So all the guys that I cover. I swear to God to you, I couldn't, I've never believed this until I started covering Apple. I'd never gone to a press event where the reporters clap. They clap and cheer. You know, Steve would announce some minor thing, and it also has this. And they'd be like, oh, God, Steve. You know? They'd be like weeping. And I covered IBM. Nobody ever clapped at an IBM event. You know, they, they just sit there like, oh, shit, make it be over soon. You know, it's like, please make it end. And, um, but even weirder than the company and its PR people and Steve, are like the fans, and this is where I don't want to get anybody, if any of you have ever waited in line for an Apple product, don't put up your hand, but like, just live in shame for the rest of your life, okay? Because like, I, I don't get it, right? There's no shortage of the product, right? And I like the product, but you can order them online. There's this thing called the internet. You can go on the website and order, they'll send it to your house. You don't have to do this, right? And yet they do, and then I realized, of course, they don't, they're not doing it for the product. They do it because they want the world to see them. And you know, as brand people, I guess, you know, you appreciate that. I mean, can you imagine having a brand so powerful that idiots would stand out on the street so that they could have that brand like attached to them? It's so meaningful to them that they want it to be imputed onto themselves, right? But this is a Macworld Expo from a few years ago in San Francisco where 
I had heard about this, but I didn't believe it, that people camped out the night before one of these Steve Jobs keynotes. So I went out to San Francisco. I get up at 4 in the morning. And I went out thinking, like, I'm going to see, you know, there's going to be 10 people out there. There's, like, hundreds of people. They've been out all night. They goes around the block and around. They have tents, guitars, little folding chairs. They get everything, right? They've been there all fucking night, right? And it's cold, right? It's really cold out. And I'm saying, why are you here? Because, you know, you can't get in without a ticket. And if you have a ticket, you're going to get in. The door's open at 10. You can just walk in. You don't have to do this, right? There's no need to camp out for the thing, right? And the rationalization was, yeah, but if you're at the front of the line, you can be one of the first ones in. You get right down front close to Steve, you know? I'm like, you guys are fucked up. I mean, these are grown men. And again, women, there's no women, right? This is all guys. Like, only men do this, right? Only men. Look at the picture. They're all, only men do, are this stupid, right, to do this, right? And I've met people, people that I know and like who told me, oh, yeah, I stood in line for Mac when I was like, okay. I don't say anything. But, you know, like, really? I, I lasted about 15 minutes, and I went around the corner to a Starbucks, and I posted this as Steve. Today's group suicide moved up to 3 p.m. You know, wear loose clothing and take off all your watch and jewelry. Um, you know, and the thing of it is, there really, there really is a religious element to Apple. And again, as brand people, I think there's something very powerful about this. See, they did a study, this is what the headline's about, and they found out that when they showed um, Apple fans Apple iconography, their brains reacted in a way similar to the way religious people react when they're um, shown like a cross or something. And again, tiptoeing into the edge of religion here, okay, so I'm sorry about this. But, so I grew up Catholic, and I became an atheist because I think that's the inevitable outcome of a Catholic education. And, <laughs> and, and, um, and again, I'm sorry if, you, if you're a believing Christian. I, good for you. Um, anyway, so, so look at the church, right? This is, this, is, this is from that same story. But like Apple, you know, they build these, these stores that look like cathedrals. So Bill Gates kind of snarkily said that, you know, yeah, well, we didn't build a pyramid next to Central Park. Ha, ha, ha. But like basically, you know, they try to make this look like a cathedral, these soaring open spaces with lots of glass, right? And, you know, again, as a Catholic, you know, I grew up, you know, you, I don't know if you, you know, I think, some of your Catholic. You go into the priest holds up a host. I was an altar boy, and no, I didn't get diddled, but thank you for thinking about it. I know that's what you thought, and no, I didn't. And I almost kind of felt bad about it at the end, you know, because I felt like other kids did. What was wrong with me, you know? And like, and, you know, and I was a cute kid, but you know, I really was. I'm not now, but I was, you know, I was cute. Uh, but anyway, that's horrible. That's horribly bad taste. I'm sorry. Um, but the point is, the priest holds up a host, right, and he says, take this, all of you, eat it. This is my body, and there's this connection. The implicit transaction that takes place there is that the priest is in the role of Christ, and he's saying, this is a piece of my body, and you're going to take it, and you're going to eat it, and we're going to have this physical connection with the divine, right? And Jobs comes out, and he holds up an iPod or an iPhone. Like, and again, as a Catholic, I'm just sitting there going, like, ar, 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 you know, like, and he's dressed like a priest. He's got the collar, right, you know? And he's not saying, I'm going to give you a ticket to heaven, but he's saying, I'm going to give you a heaven on earth, right? You're going to transcend day-to-day -day life through technology. You know, I think Jobs was a phenomenal genius in the sense that he's the first one who figured out that consumerism is a religion in this country. And that if you could somehow fill this spiritual emptiness that people felt, this void in their souls, with consumerism instead of religion, right? You can make them buy shit, right? Like, how brilliant is that, right? I mean... It's amazing, right? And I really do think that that's what, what he figured out early, early on. Um, at this point, please don't get mad at me. I'm sorry about the religion stuff. But um, the other great thing about doing this blog, and again, as digital people, you'll appreciate this. You know, I worked in print, and I still work in print. And the one huge thing that I realized after a while is even though I was anonymous, I could tell the truth in a way that I could never tell the truth in my day-to-day -day job. And I don't mean that the media lies, but we kind of do, right? I mean, even in our, just in our attempt to be balanced, we lie. You know, in the China, we have to give both sides, blah, blah, blah. We can't really say what we think, so we lie, right? You know, the one good thing about Forge was they always said, if you're writing a story, tell this as if you were telling it to your dad or your brother. Like, would you tell your brother to buy this stock? Then don't write a nice story about them, you know? Say what you tell your friends. But still, we hold back. As a blogger, I was able to do things that, that I couldn't do in print and that were funny but also kind of true. So this is, oh, I'm sorry about the, oh, I forgot this guy. I go back to the religion point. He's just gone into church and been baptized by the Holy Spirit. Oh, and sorry, this one, I forgot this guy too. Um, this is the iPhone 4S, right? This guy waited in line overnight to get an Apple iPhone 4S, and you know he doesn't need it. You know he already has the iPhone 4 because look at his hair and his glasses and his shoes, okay, right? 
you know he's an Apple user, right? At this point, the only people lined up already have the previous Apple products, right? And he's hugging the guy who sold him this $400 overpriced phone and kissing him, right? And I think I suggest there's two, two reactions to this. One is you just laugh and call him a jackass, and, which is totally valid. And then two, after that, you stop and think, well, how can my brand do that? Like, how on earth could we get people to kiss us after we sell them something ridiculously expensive, right? Um, <laughs> You know, you know the people at Microsoft who just sit in the going, like, Jesus, how can we do that? Right? You know, like, what do we have to do? Bombers are you know, sweating and powering his hands. You know? But I mean, it is an amazingly powerful brand for whatever reason. I think part of it is they've been doing it for 35 years. They started in the 70s. They've got a whole generation or two generations of really passionate fans who will do, who'll buy anything they make, right? And they do make great stuff. I mean, if Apple was making crap, some of this would be happening, but not all of it, right? Anyway. Here's something about telling the truth. Every time you buy a Dell, a baby seal dies. So basically, at the time, Apple was getting all this grief from Greenpeace. I'm sorry. Dell, Dell's not a sponsor, are they? Good. Ah. Anyway, so, but wait, there is a sponsor I'm about to offend. Um, so, so Apple was getting all this grief about Greenpeace, and Dell was actually claiming we're the green, we have a green initiative, we've set aside all this money for green. So Steve decided to fire back and say, just to remember this, if you buy a Dell, a baby seal dies. Then another better one was when Windows Vista came out. Okay, again, I'm working at Forbes, and you know you have to say, well, it's a new version of Windows, and they'll probably saw a lot, and blah blah blah. And some people have criticized. You have to, you can't really say what you want to say, which was simply this: Vista drops tomorrow, right? <laughs> and I still think this was the best review of Vista I saw anywhere, right? It actually was on the money. It was like totally accurate, and you didn't even have to say anything, right? Okay, but the best one, and I'm almost wrapping up now. Operation Chokehold. Okay, AT&T is a sponsor here, I think. So. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> anyway, a, a few years ago, uh, Randall Stevenson at AT&T came out and made this comment, or one of his guys made a comment at a conference saying, you know what, these iPhone users are using so much data, we've got to find a way to choke them back. They're just cramming our network and they're just ruining everything for everybody, right? So I wrote this long rant, it was not so brief chat with Randall Stevenson, saying, dude, dude, think about it. Like, we have a smash hit on our hands. We have this product that everybody wants. They, and then when they get it, they use it so much, they're like crushing your network. The correct response is not to say, let's get them to use it less, right? The correct response is build more fucking towers, you know? Like, like get the, get the, build out your network, you know? And, and, and went on to, to rant about saying, you know, this is kind of what's wrong with America, that, you know, it used to be if you had the best, biggest network, then let's make it the best. If you had the best, let's do something that's mind-blowing, that's so far beyond what everybody could ever do. Now it's all about number count. It's, about, it's basically about saying, we take in this much revenue, we can optimize our earnings by, you know, not investing in infrastructure and kind of run it out that way. We're going to run out the clock. So it was this long, passionate thing, and it went totally viral. And you never know why these things are going to go. I wrote it on a Friday afternoon, and all weekend long, it went nuts on the, on the internet. So that was fine. I got in trouble because Monday morning I get up, and I said, geez, you know, thanks a lot for all the, you know, the hits this weekend and the links, blah, blah, blah. And they said, you know, some of the engineers at Apple had an idea. Since AT&T is so pissed about us using you know, their network, this Friday at noon Pacific time, let's all get on like YouTube or some kind of really data-heavy app and just crush their whole network and take it down, right? And we're going to call it Operation Chokehold, right? So then I went off to work, and I forgot all about it. Like later in the day, this guy calls me. Like, like I get a call from a reporter. He's like, dude, do you know what's going on? Like these high school kids or college kids started a Facebook group. They're going to do it. And I was like, no, they're not. Yes, they are, right? So it gets kind of bad. AT&T puts out a statement, chokehold is irresponsible and pointless and like they're mad at me. Now, I'm working at Newsweek now and they know who I am, right? Like I'm a respectable journalist, right? So, and I'm like kind of bummed out, but then I, thought, I wrote a thing saying, well, you know, pointless and irresponsible is what this whole blog is all about. I mean, you know, do you not get what we do here? And then I kind of got pissed because, you know, you're the guys who made $40 billion in revenue and $10 billion in profit selling a network that doesn't work, so fuck you for calling me irresponsible, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know? So, um, thank you. Wow, AT&T hate, I love it. So then I decided, you know what, now they just got me pissed off enough, I'm gonna do like some real reporting. So I looked, there's their wireless data revenues going up and up and up and up and up, the top bars, right? There's their infrastructure investment. Wow, wow, kind of not doing so well, not going up and up and up. But boy, look at the net income. Flat as somebody's managing those earnings perfectly. And I was like, you know, if you guys could engineer your network as well as you engineer your earnings, you know, we would be able to make phone calls on your network. That would be great, you know? Um, so then it gets worse. The FCC puts out a statement saying, Operation Chokehold is a significant public safety concern, and my picture is next to it. Like, I'm the one doing it, right? And I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ, like, I am so dead. Like, Friday, I am dead. You know, this is really bad. And then it gets on Wolf Blitzer. I swear to God, it's on Wolf Blitzer, right? 
They're, they're calling it Operation Chokehold, these hackers, and blah, 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 led by, I'm like, oh, shit, I am dead. So then I thought, if I'm going to go out, I'm probably going to get fired Friday. I'm going to go out in a blaze of glory. I'm going to have fun with this, you know? So I started doing fake stories. World leaders gathered together to condemn Operation Chokehold, you know? And then I had Obama. I'm not saying don't do it, and I'm not saying do it. I'm just saying we should take some more time and think about it some more and look at it from every possible angle, you know? And it, yeah. <laughs> then I had Al Gore. Chokehold could raise ocean levels by more than a meter, leaving much of the world underwater and without power, you know? And Bin Laden, why didn't I think of this, you know? And, uh, <laughs> And uh, Sarah Palin, Jesus says, don't do it. And by the way, Levi's penis is only this big. And again, I'm pretty sure this is the first use of the word penis in a slide this week. So there you go. And then Glenn Beck, why are you trying to ruin Christmas? Because it was December, right? It was December when this happened. And then George was, hey, who wants to go see Avatar? You know, uh, I heard it's great. They got, they got these hot chicks in 3D. Um, anyway, so in the end, in the end, nothing happened, because you, know, you can't take down a network with, you know, they did, all these stories ran Friday, like it seemed like we had a little slowdown in Seattle, but like, you can't take down a, a cell phone network with a, a few people, right? Um, but what did happen is that the stock went down like, I don't know, a couple bucks, and which I, I added up and it worked out to like $2 billion. I was like, yes! And then, um, um, curiously, suddenly their headline feed on Yahoo was like, all the places where we're investing in infrastructure, we're investing here, we're investing there. We're investing here. So I think saying, you know what, we accomplished something. Meanwhile, Friday, I get a call from my editor at Newsweek, like, hey, what's up? I hadn't heard from her all week. I'm like, no, not much. How about you? Good. <laughs> so, yeah, so what do you worry? I said, so, you know, have you heard about this uh, chokehold thing? And she's like, oh, yeah, 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 I've heard about it. So apparently, AT&T had been on the phone all week long, threatening to pull all their ads. They wanted to be fired, blah, blah, blah. And Newsweek, we were being sold at the time. We're going under, so they didn't give a shit anymore. <laughs> they were just like, they were like, nothing we can do, man. It's not our blog. He's a lunatic. Sorry. Um, and, and so, but in the end, the, the lesson to me was like, this is what we should have been doing at Newsweek. This, you know, this is what journalists were supposed to do. We're supposed to, we're supposed to be muckrakers. We're supposed to rattle cages and, and you know, mess with people this way. I mean, maybe not so obscenely, but you know, still, um, the intention was good. To sum up. Just to think about Apple as this exceedingly weird company that still is very weird and cultish. This year, analyst estimates are doing $156 billion in sales, which, right? They'll probably do more because they're always low. Market cap now is $430 billion. They're going to uh, introduce this TV product, I think, this year. And again, just like the iPad and the iPhone, it's not just a device, right? It's a whole stack. It's a whole integrated, vertically integrated stack of content, apps, and hardware. Um, I actually think they could be, in five years, we might be looking at a company with at least $200 billion in sales and a, and a market cap approaching a trillion dollars, you know? Which is an amazing story, considering that, again, in 1996 and 97, Michael Dell would have just given the money back to the shareholders. Um, thank you very much for your time. If you want to have, ask questions, we can, or I'll just split and you can go have fun, okay? Thank you. Ah, oh, look at this guy. You've had too much to drink. Thank you. Do you, do, you, do you have questions or no? Anybody want to have a talk about, no? Slave labor in China, anyone? Dan, going once, amazing, going twice? amazing. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. So I don't know if there's a better way to end an iconic branding uh, summit than uh, with, a, with a hilarious plus intelligent uh, overview of Apple. So I thank Dan Lyons greatly for being here. Um, I thank all of you greatly for being here. We have um, a post reception, of course, and uh, a dinner to get through. And so thank you guys all so much for being here. Um, Dan, again, I want to say, uh, Brilliant perspective on a brand that uh, inspires all of us. I'm sure, show of hands, iPhone 4S, iPad 2. Um, I, I have that cute little notebook. I don't even know what to call it. It's so tiny. It fits in my purse. But anyway, we're all huge Apple fans and technology fans and media fans. And so thank you for summing this up for us. Uh, Everybody, enjoy your dinners and have a great night. And uh, thank you for being here. And let's thank Dan once again. And we really appreciate his humor and his insight.